I just turned 30 and it makes me think I should start paying a bit more attention to my health. So I just read Peter Atiyah's book called Outlive. And to me, the main message of this book is that our healthcare system does a good job at responsive treatment, meaning if you break your bone, they can fix it. But they do a pretty terrible job at preventative treatment. And oftentimes that falls into the hands of the individual. And a big part of taking control of that is getting your blood work done. And as you'll hear Jariah say later on in the video, you can't fix the engine if you don't look under the hood. So this led me to reach out to Merrick Health and get my blood work done. And for the sake of transparency, I reached out to Merrick and they offered to sponsor this video and they provided the coupon code LIMI if anyone else is interested in getting their blood work done. Now throughout this conversation, you'll hear us both say things like as we talked about before, things like that. That's just because I forgot to hit the record button the first time we went through this. So this is our second run through the same results. And um, you can tell I'm using these headphones. My microphone just broke. I'm kind of struggling technology wise nowadays. Just to give you an idea about where I was at heading into this blood test. The only supplement I am taking is creatine. And the goal is to get my base blood work done first and then start to add on different lifestyle changes to see if those will improve my blood work. Then we can add on supplements to get the best bang for our buck. So this is gonna be us going through my base blood work. And what you'll hear is that the lifestyle change we wanna test first is ice baths. So this is my base blood work. And then in a few months after I've done ice baths consistently, we're gonna get another blood test done and see if ice baths created a measurable difference in my blood work. And throughout that time, I'm gonna try and keep my other lifestyle choices and diet and things like that consistent um, so we can try and isolate this variable as much as possible. So without further ado, here are my initial blood results with Merrick Health. Yeah, let's just kind of start at the top uh, and go from top to bottom. And one of the things I would like to do this time is kind of talk about, um, you know, maybe how some of these things could be more important than others, specifically in regard to like jujitsu and recovery from training and things like that. I think that's something that um, we kind of left on the table last time that I would like to bring out a little bit more um, now that we've had a little a little practice. So um, jumping in here, basically, we'll just kind of go over um, uh, some of the things that uh, we talked about previously, like your testosterone levels were great. Um, you know, it's actually nowadays pretty difficult for a lot of people to have an 872 testosterone level, you know, averages in the four or five hundreds, maybe. So, uh, you know, having a testosterone level there, this is this is where we would try to get people if they were on testosterone replacement therapy. So it just goes to show you, um, you know, how beneficial, you know, sleeping well, diet, exercise, uh, you know, making sure you're getting that hard training in uh, can be for you. And, you know, some of these things like these recommendations on here are just going to be to help leverage uh, your uh, total testosterone and your free testosterone for maximum benefit here. And like we talked about before, um, we have pretty high standards when it comes to what optimal ranges are for things. So you'll see sometimes the lab corporate reference ranges will be a little bit different from our optimal reference ranges. Basically, when we look at this here, it, it I don't really care what your age is. If your free testosterone is 5.1 nanograms per deciliter, um, that's too <laughs> that's too low, you know. So so these reference ranges, uh, you know, it may they may be considered the normal reference ranges, but normal doesn't always equal healthy, especially in healthcare nowadays. So uh, when we do look at these, this is just going to be our own clinical guidelines for where we see guys feel their best. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So two things that come to mind is one, I'm like, this was one thing I, I was really interested to see where I kind of stacked up and I kind of like how you guys have it, you know, front and center. It's the, the first thing on the, on the report. And uh, secondly, um, in Peter Tia's book, he talks about that um, basically range that you're talking about and how if you don't have kind of high standards, people can get away with being technically like in the range, even though they're like on the verge of being diabetic, you know? So I think having high standards for this stuff is, is very important. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I really, I, I really appreciated that. I just, I just finished that book, um, a little while ago and, um, yeah, that's definitely something that we run into is, is, you know, when people get their lab corp results back, they'll go like, Oh, everything looks like it's in range. And then we'll send them out this, uh, you know, kind of written report that breaks down 
things a little more stringently and uh there'll be a, <laughs> i'll get a phone call or a message that goes like geez there's a lot of red out here is everything okay and it's like yeah yeah everything is okay in the grand scheme of things most likely but you're definitely not going to be performing as well as you potentially could if we move some of these things in the right direction right so i think that's where it really comes into play is how how well do you want to perform and i think the answer for most of most of our guys most of your followers or people who are watching what you do need to be performing at a high level i mean you know if you can't go into a training session busted and uh expect to expect to do well right so um you know, having some of these higher expectations for some of these things can be beneficial um, in the long run for recovery and performance. So, you know, and then we'll have so, some simple things like uh, boron and magnesium supplementation. This this is really low, low hanging fruit for a lot of guys because, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, boron is going to help by lowering production of SHBG and uh, magnesium is going to preferentially bind to SHBG. Um, and this magnesium is actually going to help with sleep quality. You, you remember, we're going to see this a lot through uh, through uh, the recommendations just because it's going to help with sleep quality. It's going to help lower SHBG, potentially improve some of this free, this, uh, some free testosterone for you. Um, really no reason not to take it. We like uh, magnesium glycinate in general is, is one of those things. Um, and then realistically, magnesium in general, a lot of people are magnesium deficient. And uh, especially for your jujitsu guys, you're gonna look and see this is probably gonna have a lot of benefit for people. Gonadotropins, uh, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. These are basically uh, the hormones that are going to signal the testes to produce testosterone uh, and stimulate sperm production. So you can see those are right where we want them to be uh, in the reference range there, which is great. Um, prolactin levels, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, sometimes these can be a little bit high. If uh, you remember, remember a little bit later on, we'll talk about thyroid function a little bit, and that can impact um, these prolactin levels a little bit because um, you're not doing any of this stuff that can potentially cause that. But some of the symptoms of high prolactin can be uh, you know, reduced sex drive, lack of energy, erectile dysfunction, impaired fertility. With where you're at, you're probably not running into a lot of that stuff, but we can pretty easily just supplement with a vitamin B6, um, a P5P uh, version of that vitamin B6, and that's going to help uh, reduce prolactin levels by uh, potentially stimulating uh, dopamine production and dopamine's a prolactin inhibiting hormone. So that can be very helpful for that there. Um, any questions on that? No. Okay, yeah. awesome, awesome. Makes sense. Yeah, cortisol levels, we talked about this a little bit. Cortisol levels were a little bit high. Not so high, be super worried about it. Um, one of the things that's really important for anything that we're doing when it comes to uh, you know, managing stress and recovery is just making sure that our sleep is good, um, making sure that we're locking in our circadian rhythm. That means, you know, being up with the sun, trying to get the blue light out um, as early, early as possible, you know, um, trying to uh, avoid eating super late. You know, I would try and say uh, a couple hours before bed. If you're training late in the day, though, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Sometimes that's impossible, and I would rather make sure that you get some protein and some fat in uh, after your training, just to make sure um, that you know we're fueling uh, you know protein synthesis through uh, through the night and not kind of waking up uh, unrecovered. I guess so. Um, that's uh, that's pretty important for us there. Um, so sex hormone binding globulin. So do you think? Talked, go ahead. What so for? Uh... For the cortisol levels, mm -hmm. um, one, do you think the ice baths that I'm doing, are you interested to see what that will do to cortisol? Right. Um, I don't know if the, that'll have effect. And then two, the magnesium, if I started supplementing magnesium, would that potentially help with cortisol as well? Right. So I think that anytime you do anything that is going to reduce inflammation, um, you know, it may not be the most relaxing thing when you're doing it, but your body does feel better when you, when you've done an ice bath. I mean, uh, like you and I, we both do them pretty frequently. I do them five, six days a week. I think you said you're doing them what six, six days a week right now. So um, yeah. I do imagine 
that we could potentially see some improvement here. And I do think that using the magnesium before bed and being able to actually kind of wind down and relax a little bit and feel the body relax a little bit. Um, like I said, anytime you're going to be able to manage stress a little bit is going to help, uh, is going to help with cortisol. So, you know, other things too, is obviously, you know, spending time actually winding down and, uh, and not putting yourself in a high stress environment, right. Actually, you know, doing the kind of self care required to, you know, get out of that, uh, fight or flight mode and, and into some relaxation is going to be helpful. going to be really helpful. Right. Yeah. I know that last time we, uh, last time we talked, you, you, uh, gave this example and I think it's, you know, hard to do, but I think it would be really beneficial. Like you talked about how, you know, if you have training at seven thirty, seven o'clock and you get home at like, you know, nine and a lot of people get home and turn on the TV and then eat their, you know, big meal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it would be better to, you know, not, expose yourself to that type of light. And especially if you're eating where you're doing like you're compounding stuff, you're eating late and you're exposing yourself to light, you're kind of like setting yourself up for a bit of failure when it comes to getting quality sleep. Right. Yeah. I think, but I mean, it's so, I mean, it's, a, that's like such a big part of American culture, right? Come home, put the TV on, yeah. food, that kind of stuff. Like it's a pretty common habit, but unfortunately, like you said, you really are compounding negative uh, effects on your sleep there. So uh, I think there's a huge benefit to, um, you know, there's a lot of different media that you can consume besides television. And I think that reading audiobooks, you know, throw a podcast on something like that can be super beneficial. Um, uh, anything that is just a little less uh, stimulation than television, because then you don't get the, that blue light um, in that late at night, it's going to be really helpful for kind of balancing that stuff out. So let's see here. Yeah, SHBG, we talked about this a little bit. So this is a, this is a little bit high, not crazy high, but you know, with that boron supplementation, uh, magnesium supplementation, we can potentially see a little bit of a decrease there. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, reasons that this could be high. We don't really necessarily need to go into that, but we do know a couple of things that we can do uh, supplement wise to bring that down potentially. And then you can see, you know, if we bring the SHBG down a little bit, um, it's pretty likely that we can see an increase in this free testosterone level as well. So nice. that would be, that'll be an interesting when we do follow-up labs, uh, a couple more sets of follow-up labs, see if we can get some movement on that. Estrogen levels were good for you. Pregnenolone levels were good for you. Uh, DHEA, we had talked about this. DHEA was a little bit low. So that's one of your master sex hormones need it for libido, energy levels, immune function, um, you know, making sure that your uh, DHEA levels are where they need to be are going to help with things like brain fog, energy levels during the day, uh, mood, well-being, memory, uh, sleep quality, blood glucose, tons of important stuff like that. Um, in general, uh, we can, we would kind of just start out at like 25 milligrams of DHEA. This, I'm pretty sure I covered this last time, but uh, DHEA is going to be on some band lists, depending on where you're right, competing yeah. and what you're competing in. Um, so always, before you start any supplement, I'll just say this, before you start any supplement or medication, always make sure you're checking with any group or federation or wherever, you know, if you're competing uh, with, with anyone else, make sure you're not doing yourself a disservice if you do have to do uh, testing and then you go like, Oh, I didn't know that that was, you know, oh, there's DHEA in my burrito or something like that. Right. <laughs> you know, you don't find, find yourself with your pants down. Um, so that is one of the things, but realistically, um, you're not going to get, it, it's not going to give you the same, uh, benefit of taking testosterone. If your testosterone was low, this is just going to clean up some of the back end stuff down this neurosteroid cascade. So, um, that may be something to consider at some point. Progesterone levels were good. Uh, we've gone over this. We used IGF-1 to take a look at um, growth hormone, uh, kind of as a surrogate marker. Looks like you were doing great right there. Now, this is one of the things that I did want to talk about. 
Have you been in uh, one of the questions that I'm not sure if I had asked was, have you been in a calorie deficit or have you been training like more than you have been when you got this test done? Uh, you know, honestly, probably just because I'm coming from Lanai, which is like a pretty small island mm -hmm. and uh, it's like a full day of travel to mm -hmm. uh, to get there mm -hmm. um, to California. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically like had breakfast got there didn't eat like the whole day had you know the the peanuts on the uh, plane kind of deal right. um but then got there had you know a little dinner but then all the it was already time to start my my fast so um yeah i would say like i didn't have much to eat um in preparation for this this test um, how about in the couple of months that's... before that yeah i would say uh i would say very similar like uh yeah, I got invited to go to um, Henzo Gracie's in Austin, and I kind of ramped up my training for that. And I would say I didn't really modify my uh, my eating um, okay. too much. And right. uh, like I wasn't taking like the only the only supplement I was taking is creatine. I wasn't taking any sort of you know protein or, or any other supplementation. So, uh, yeah, that was my, that was my situation. Yeah. Interesting. I'm curious to see, I'm curious to see on follow-ups if this is still ele elevated because, you know, your thyroid hormone levels were good, but basically when we see thyroid stimulating hormone elevated, a lot of the times, um, it can indicate that there's insufficient levels of thyroid hormone. Now, I don't think that's the case for you. But, you know, sometimes as we, if we're, if we're uh, not eating as much as we need to, sometimes, you know, as I see like, uh, you know, bodybuilders, for example, or someone who's been on a prolonged weight cut to make a weight class or something like that, they can see thyroid stimulating hormone uh, levels elevated. So I would say try and for your next test, try and be in like a maintenance amount of calories, whatever that kind of feels like for you intuitively. And then um, I think, uh, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see where that's at because right now we wouldn't necessarily want to do anything. Uh, we could always consider doing some uh, thyroid support, just making sure you're getting zinc, selenium, iodine, uh, and a couple of other botanicals that could potentially be beneficial to uh, you know help you produce. Basically, just give your thyroid the substrate it needs to produce the thyroid hormone. Um, and uh, and you can always do that. Another way to do that is I kind of just think about this as a multivitamin for the thyroid specifically, essentially. But you can do that by tracking uh, micronutrients through something like the chronometer app. And I think for athletes, it's really important if you've never tracked your food diligently for an extended period of time to see what your protein intake, your carbohydrate intake, your fat intake are see if you're coming up short on any of these micronutrients, you know, because it'll have that all listed out for you, like, you know, the daily amount that you need. Um, when it comes to fine tuning performance, I think that's going to be uh, a variable that I think I don't, uh, that I think a lot of guys aren't actually taking into consideration. They think like, I'll just, I'll eat more if I need to eat more, I'll eat less if I need to eat less without actually tracking those things. And when you really fine tune how many carbohydrates you need to go train for four hours, uh, you know, <laughs> you're going to get better results, especially when you're looking at, um, at certain things. Another thing that I've been really liking with some of my higher level athletes is doing a sweat test where you actually will go, mm -hmm. you know, go train, put the sweat test on, find out how much sodium you're losing, find out how many liters of water you're losing per hour of training. And then you know how much to replace while you're doing that. So you can stay at optimum, uh, like an optimum performance level. And if you're in a tournament or something like that, I mean, that could be the difference between winning and not winning, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly competitive. So having all of those variables figured out is, is something that you can do in advance. So reverse T3 was a little bit uh, elevated. Uh, so it, it's interesting to see this reverse T3 elevate as well, particularly during periods of stress, right? So obviously your cortisol levels were a little bit high. It's probably from the travel. I don't know anybody who likes to get on a plane for hours and, you know, travel, um, and, and ends up not being a little stressed from that. So uh, I think it's 
probably just everything that kind of comes around with that because we're not really seeing anything else that would you know cause that to be and there's only a slight elevation there so i wouldn't be uh super concerned about that i'd be curious that's one of those ones i'd be curious to see where it comes out on follow-up labs basically uh glucose like you'd said uh you know you were you were fasting but what you had eaten before you fasted can impact that i don't really look at this as much as i look at hemoglobin a1c is this is going to be a measure of your blood glucose levels over the previous couple of months and you can see that that's right there in the optimal range and, and we keep a pretty uh, strict range there so anything under 5.2 i'm pretty happy with um you know most people come in there quite a bit quite a bit out of that range so um, basically this is just something that we monitor over time and make sure um, that your average blood glucose is acceptable if not then there's you know different things we can do increase cardiovascular exercise um you know, I, I really like 10 minute walks after meals. I, I've seen that have huge, as, as big of an impact as lots of different types of medications and supplements on uh, on blood glucose. So I, I think that's a big one that anybody can do. Um, just 10 minute walks after meals can have a huge impact. Your insulin levels were great at 3.3. So your insulin sensitivity is good. That means you're gonna build muscle um, and not necessarily store fat. Um, super easily so that's really great when it comes to your metabolic health there now we'll get into the some of the heart health stuff apo a1 was a little bit low um a couple of the things uh that we can do uh for that is just to kind of monitor and and give a check um uh a little bit in the future i'll talk about this a lot with a lot of people i i think a really low-hanging fruit when it comes to inflammation and hdl is just to make sure you get a, a su sufficient amount of omega-3. So there's a lot of ways you can do that. I really like, personally, I do, I eat a can of sardines every day and I supplement with two grams of fish oil. Wow. So um, I think that that is, uh, you know, and not everybody's, not everybody's into that. So uh, yeah, I actually did cod, I actually ate straight up cod livers a little while ago. I ordered them from Norway uh, and it was just eating straight cod livers because it was like, why would I buy cod liver oil if I could just eat the livers? But I'm a little more on the extreme end of things. Um, yeah, that's next level. But, uh, what do you but, do with the sardines? What do you do with the sardines? I eat them. Eat them? So, so I'll you my breakfast almost every day is I'll do, uh, I'll do a piece of sourdough toast. I'll smash a half of an avocado on it, put some everything bagel, uh, uh, seasoning on the top. Right. Seasoning. And then I'll throw the, I'll throw a can of sardines on top of that with some, uh, broccoli sprouts or alpha sprouts. And then usually, uh, uh, a whole egg or two on top of that. And that's usually, that's usually nice. breakfast for me. Um, but I, I really like to pack in the healthy fats in the morning just because I feel like it really helps with brain function. And then it's not so heavy that I can't go to the gym or hit the mats or something like that right after I eat. You know, if I have like too heavy of a breakfast, then I'm, I, I don't really want to go get beat up. So uh, that's usually how, uh, how I like to do it. But uh, yeah, so, you know, and you can get this. Uh, you can get this in capsule form, right? So obviously just take a high quality fish oil supplement. A lot of the times I'll recommend like Thorn. Uh, I think they have like super EPA pro or something like that. Um, really, you just want to make sure whoever you're getting your fish oil from is testing for mercury and that, you know, they haven't been sitting in an Amazon warehouse at 130 degrees for the last six months, right? So you want to probably get direct from the manufacturer or someone like us here at Merrick where we can actually get you pharmaceutical grade from the compounding pharmacies. And then that's obviously going to be pure and uh, and tested and and not uh, rancid. Unfortunately, a lot of fish oil will get rancid while it sits in the warehouses and stuff, which is super gross. Um, but uh, yeah, so another thing that we talked about here is your... Uh, your lipoprotein A. So this is largely genetically influenced. So basically this is an independent uh, risk factor for atherosclerosis and uh, heart disease. So when we see this elevated, then we know we need to take precautions if we see other things elevated as well. Um, you know, there are uh, are some things that you can potentially do. Niacin, uh, you can use niacin, but you do want to make sure it's a sustained re release niacin. I remember, uh, you know, trying non-sustained release niacin and, and uh, it can cause some pretty big flushing. Uh, and that's pretty uncomfortable. I had a guy call me who'd gone to the emergency room. He didn't know that that could happen. So you really want to start with like a lower dose and make sure it's sustained release there. Um, 
And then uh, potentially stuff like low dose aspirin, um, L-carnitine. We do prefer injectable L-carnitine over oral L-carnitine that you could just get at the supplement store because the bioavailability is much higher um, and you kind of avoid the first pass metabolism, uh, which can lead to an increase in TMAO, which is associated with some uh, pretty negative stuff. So uh, that's in general why we why we recommend the l uh, the uh this uh amino acid as an injectable medication so but uh getting on to some of the other stuff so your triglycerides were really great um and a lot of your other cholesterols were where we would want them to be like this ldl uh, is low 71 that's great that's in the optimal range apob is another big one that we look at uh just because this is going to be present in all the atherogenic lipoproteins all the you know quote bad cholesterols, right? So really this and triglycerides are two of the main ones. Peter Atia kind of talks about that in his books as, in his book as well. Um, having ApoB and he's a little crazy when it comes, I think he said something like, he, he, I'm not sure if he still does, but I remember him saying something about like 30, having it under 30 or something like that. And I'm not entirely sure how that that's even humanly possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think I, I think anywhere under 70 or 80, you're doing a lot better than uh, than average. And so being at 58 here is, is fantastic. And your HDL cholesterol is doing really well here as well. So, um, so like I was saying, although you do have this higher, uh, um, where is it at here? Lipoprotein A, a lot of your other variables are really, really good, right? You're, you're not pack, packing around a lot of body fat. Your insulin sensitivity is pretty good. Uh, the rest of your cholesterol profile is pretty good. So overall, um, I'm pretty happy with with where things are at. Now, that's getting, this is honestly like one of the one of the reasons I wanted to do this because mm -hmm. I've never done anything like this before, and I really wanted to see if I was like genetically predisposed to some sort of you know disease. So it sounds like I need to be kind of, uh, you know, monitor my heart, heart health, um, yep. pretty closely. And there's, there's different things that you can do at different points in your life. Like at your age, I wouldn't necessarily say, uh, you need to do a lot of the more extreme things, but you can do the things like, a uh, a, a calcium score, a CT angiogram to see if you have any, uh, any uh, any plaque buildup and, and things like that. And um, just monitor over time, man, you know, now that you know that there could potentially be, uh, potentially be an issue there, then you, you know to look out for it. Cause uh, you know, you can't, uh, I like to say you can't fix the engine if you don't look under the hood. And that's basically what we're doing okay. here with the, with this lab work, you know? Um, so we talked about this. Did you, did you see that? I'm oh, sorry. What happened? Did you see that show with uh, with Chris Hemsworth on uh, Disney Plus? Yeah, he had one of the APO e genotypes yeah, exactly. or something like that, right? Yeah, uh, so he's yeah. predisposed for for Alzheimer's, right? Yeah, and they were they were talking about how he was, you know, X times more likely to get Alzheimer's, but you can basically mitigate other factors to get you down like closer to normal pretty much. So, um, it sounds like a similar situation with my, with my heart health. Yeah. And just to, uh, so when it does come to, to Alzheimer's, making sure you're getting like high quality fats, like those omega threes, like we were talking about, um, uh, making sure checking things like your neurosteroids, like your, uh, pregnenolone levels, which yours were great. Uh, DHEA levels, which were a little bit low, would eventually at some point want to improve those numbers, right? The DHEA numbers. Um, and those, those are going to be some things that could potentially help uh, improve Alzheimer's and dementia risk. So just kind of go on a tangent there. Um, so with this homocysteine elevated, we talked about MTHFR gene mutations, which, uh, you know, uh, pe uh, potentially may indicate impaired methylation status. Um, so one of the things that I want to do on your follow-up testing is do do some of this gene testing and see if if that comes back because you, your uh, your B12 levels were a little bit low and your homocysteine was a little bit elevated. And so we can kind of figure out if we've got any of that going on and then we can know exactly 
uh, what kind of micronutrients we need to supplement for you to decrease this homocysteine level and then improve overall longevity and health outcomes. So that'll be, I'm pretty excited to see that come back. Awesome, me too. And then let's see, I'll be, it's good, it was good. HDL was really good. That's, I mean, it's, 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 this is kind of a tougher number than people think to, to improve. Uh, prostate was looking good. Let's studies platelets were a little bit low. I've, I kind of want to see where that is on follow-up testing. We talked about that a little bit before we make any kind of assumptions there. Let's studies were good, dramatic rate. This is kind of just size uh, uh, of the red blood cell, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. White blood cells were good. Uh, liver health was really good for you. I think your GGT was nice and low. We use this as kind of a marker for liver stress. Kidney function was looking good. Uh, we did talk about maybe increasing protein intake a little bit. That might be something that you could uh, that you could improve on. Your acid was good. Vitamin D. I said, this really cracked me up. I was like, bro, you live in Hawaii. Like how? <laughs> how do you, how do you upload talk about low hanging fruit right yeah. right yeah and uh i know you had said so what are you you said you're spending more out, time outside now since you've got these results well yeah it was a shocker to me too and uh since i don't like i have to walk to the ice bath um, mm -hmm. um so what i've been doing now is it kind of like forces me to walk um mm -hmm. so i kind of have been doing that midday maybe like you know 10 o'clock 11 o'clock mm -hmm. um and that is like a 40 minute walk like you know uh there and back probably like mm -hmm. 40 minutes so that has been i would say the primary source of vitamin d but yeah like my we only have one car my wife takes it to work i don't have any like you know i'm not going to the beach every day right. so <laughs> um yeah i i spend a lot of time watching jujitsu stuff so right, not a right. Lot of sunlight right <laughs> so yeah i mean uh i'm interested to see you know and not everybody is gonna sunlight's not gonna do it for everybody sometimes you do need some supplementation there and so just making sure you're getting a high quality vitamin d uh three and k2 supplement is gonna is gonna help bring those levels up because i i don't think people realize exactly how much vitamin d does for you but if you look into it, it's a lot. And so that's yeah. kind of one of those things that uh, if you if you don't manage to kind of bust up into that optimal range on the follow-up labs, then we'll just start supplementing, see if see where that puts you, and um, and then you're going to get some benefit there. So yeah, awesome. And then we talked about this, B12 levels were a little bit low. That's something that I'll be interested in kind of implementing post-follow-up labs um, and see, uh, see where we can see where things are at and then see if we get some improvement there. Um, and that will be, uh, that'll be kind of an interesting second part of the kind of experiment here. Iron levels were good for you. Ferritin levels. Uh, I do like to talk about this a little bit, you know, with where your ferritin levels are elevated and, uh, and the fact that your liver did look, your liver and kidneys looked like it was in fairly good uh, condition. You didn't have any antibodies that would lead me to believe that you have like a Hashimoto's or Graves, and which is our thyroid related kind of autoimmune disorders. Um, this is probably just inflammation from, uh, from training. And I think that, uh, you know, there are things that we can do. So this is normally just a marker of uh, uh, the amount of iron stored in your body. And when we do see it elevated, it can ind indicate inflammation. So most guys who are, who are training pretty hard, I, I see a lot of elevated ferritin levels, right? And, and it looks like the rest of your uh, iron studies are, are well within normal ranges. So uh, I am curious to see um, where, uh, where this ends up landing when we, uh, uh, since you've been doing the ice baths, I, I think that we may yeah. see some some benefit there. And then um, I definitely do want to get some, uh, you know, kind of in part two, get some uh, omega-3 supplementation going like that kind of stuff. Some of the stuff that we've talked about, um, I think that's going to be pretty interesting. Um, and I think that uh, that pretty much covers it for that. But when it comes to inflammation, I think that's one of the easiest things that we can manage that goes overlooked. Um, when it comes to, I mean, 
how many days a week are you doing jujitsu, right? And then how many hours per session are you going? Your inflammation levels are probably going to be relatively high um, with all the with all the repair going on, and then you get an injury, and then systemic inflammation is going to increase anymore. So, um, some of these things that we've talked about, like the uh, uh, like the omegas and uh, one of the things uh, uh, I talk about a lot is using something like N-acetylcysteine. If you don't want to do injectable glutathione, glutathione is pretty potently antioxidant, but NAC is kind of a precursor to that. It's just a capsule you take like a thousand milligrams a day. That can be pretty beneficial for that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, those are just kind of a couple of the easy things you can do along with things like ice baths and active recovery, you know, you don't always have to train hard to get a good benefit. Sometimes you just need to take a walk. And I think people overlook that a lot, you know, I, I was, like I said, I was kind of ramping up my, uh, my workouts and stuff too, um, before this blood test because of that trip to Austin. So yeah, I, I imagine that that's exactly what you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, cool, man. Well, yeah. Did you have any questions or want to cover anything else while we were here? Um, I guess one, one thing that kind of popped up, um, after we talked previously, I was, I was considering, um, like, I don't, I don't take any protein currently. Mm -hmm. I don't supplement with any protein. Um, would you, or like what type of metrics would you expect to see changes in for those, uh, people who do supplement with protein? I'm not sure if we would see a lot of change necessarily on the blood work, poten potentially, but Got it. Uh, on a couple of places. But I I do think making sure you're getting adequate protein is definitely going to, you know, an adequate protein to me, I would say probably a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. Now you just figure out what your body fat percentage is, subtract that amount. Uh, from from your total weight and then you get your your lean body mass and so you know um for a lot of guys i think that that ends up being somewhere between maybe 150 200 milligrams of or 200 grams of uh protein uh per day and if you want to do a little bit more i don't think it hurts to supplement with a shake or two here and there especially you know if you can just squeeze it in and it doesn't kind of detract from the amount of whole food that you're eating so just you know an extra 25 milligram shake here or there i don't think is going to uh do anything but probably aid in in recovery as long as you're getting appropriate carbohydrate intake around your workouts as well got it cool and then the other thing um we didn't like explicitly talk about but i just kind of wanted to to say it for the people that um, are going to watch this video, but we talked about how, as far as like supplementation goes, maybe that will be on future, um, you know, follow-up lab work. And for this specific lab work, that's going to be coming up in the, in the next, um, video, we're probably just going to, you know, stick with the ice baths and the walks and mm -hmm. see how that impacts the blood work. And then after that, then we'll go into supplementation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking think, that's okay. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good plan because then we have really kind of control for a lot of the the variables and we can uh, you know make some implementation of some things that we should see differences. So we should see differences in a couple of things from what you're doing. And then when we get the follow-up blood work and we're able to implement a few things, you know, based off of that, the reason being probably things are mostly going to be the same when it comes to what the supplement recommendations were for. So at that point, we can implement those, see the differences, and then actually have like, uh, like hard data to, to kind of back up the methodology there. Right. Help isolate variables. Yeah, exactly. And the next, the next, uh, blood work I have is in November. So mm -hmm. that's a good amount of time to, uh, you know, let the uh, ice baths and the walks kind of, you know, soak in and yep. uh, yeah, adequately reflect themselves in the blood work, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. 